Paul up. Just a, a little introduction. Today, um, Helena and I and Ralph um, had the privilege um, of being on Sunshine FM on radio. I don't know if anyone heard it. I, I know some managed to hear it. It sort of happened pretty quickly, and, uh, and, and um, it, it just happened live there and then. It was the most scariest thing going, but we got through it, and guess what? We've been invited back. So next time, we'll give a really good uh, introduction to Salt Church and why people should come. But uh, it's amazing how we're getting our name out there. And so I thought, having been on the radio, um, I've caught the bug. So I thought I would do a quick interview to, for Paul, for Paul Garner. Come on down, Paul. Give a Salt Church welcome to Paul. I thought I'd uh, have a, I'd interview you very briefly to see, to see if I can do it for a start. So, this is Paul Garner. How many people know Paul? A number of you. How many people have seen Paul in church over the last... Okay. Okay, okay. one or two more. One or two. Well, you're all going to know Paul by the end of this. And his lovely wife, Dawn. That's... Stand up, Dawn. Come on, stand up. Give a round of applause for Dawn. And that's such a lovely name. I was thinking that. I said... It's dawn, isn't it, Helena? It's dawning on me, it's dawn. And dawn is such a lovely name. I got up this morning and the dawn was rising. It was beautiful. You have a beautiful name. I see the dawn rise every morning. <laughs> Paul sees dawn rise every morning. Now then, Paul. Your name is Paul Garner, okay. And um, Paul is a fully fledged, licensed, qualified, Assemblies of God minister. So Paul, tell us a little bit about, tell us a little bit about your time as an Assemblies of God pastor? So, I basically got saved in 1990 stroke 91. I can't remember really which one it was, somewhere about that time. 1993, we were going to an Assemblies of God, oh, we were going to a, a, a yeah, it wasn't, was it an Assemblies of God? No, it wasn't an Assemblies of God church. We were going to a church that kind of fell apart. And uh, so after two years of, um, of, of being saved, Everybody in the church thought I should be the one to run it. Ooh. So, so a very dangerous thing. But, but basically, Talbot Street in Nottingham um, Christian Centre, big church in Nottingham, came in and kind of oversaw us. And um, from then on, I led the church, which and was the Beacon Christian Centre in Loughborough, Leicestershire centre of the universe until I came here. And how, how long were you running the church? Was so, it a, a couple so of years or? 26 years. 26 years. Wow, you built up a lot and we of saw, we saw God's grace and some wonderful memories and some amazing people that you would not expect to get saved. And now you've got me on the story now because yeah. I've got to carry on, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. We're so for a as good, an good example, night. this is a quick example. Um, we were, we were wanting to do projects on the building, etc. There's a guy across the road from us um, by the name of Richard Morgan. Great guy now, but he, well, he, he's, he's dead now. But at the time, he was the biggest pain in the backside to me. Every time we tried to do something, he would lobby the whole of the community against us. And there was one time I was out here on holiday, enjoying ourselves, and Richard's on the phone. And I thought, I'm on holiday, I am not answering that. Wait till I get home, answer message. Paul Garner, I thought, that's a bad one. My life's in a mess, I think I need God, and I thought of you. Hallelujah, amen. And Richard was one of the first of many, many people who gave their lives to Jesus. People who have had traumatic histories terrible histories that then have gone on to know the Lord and written books and done all sorts of things. And it's been a real privilege over 26 years just to That's, be a part of that. I mean, it's truly amazing. And Paul's got a, a, a lot of stories like that. But out of your experience and some of those experience of broken people, people desperate to find God, you've moved on from being a pastor into something which is quite specific, incredibly important, and important in the body of, of Christ. Tell us a little okay, bit about so, what you're doing now. So about, I was probably about 10, 15 years into the ministry, people getting saved and coming and talking to me about some traumatic histories that they lived through. 
And um, although they'd had massive impacts of Jesus on their life, they smelt a lot more like him, but there was still a long way to go. And there was some things I was sitting listening to thinking, I don't know how to handle this. So I decided to do a level two counseling course. Just thought that would help me to sit with these people. That became level three, became level four. And as a level four uh, diploma course to become qualified as a therapist, I had to have 30 hours in the first year of my own personal therapy. Now, I'm a Pentecostal. All the past is gone, it's finished with, don't believe in counseling. And I went with the Pentecostal attitude that I'm gonna get my secular counselor saved. Two sessions in, she starts talking about me mom. And I'm in bits. Because I've had a history too. And the conditioning of my history, which I'll share a little bit about, the condition of my history meant I'd got a long way to go too. So over the last, so I became qualified in 2011 and probably sat now over 8,000 hours one-to-one therapy with people. And in the process of that, I felt it was right to step down and let somebody else take over the beacon. And, um, and so I've been counseling for four days a week. And since COVID, I can do it online, which means I can sit in the sunshine in Spain <laughs> And we've been here for 10 weeks this time, which is great. Last, last couple of questions, and then we'll leave you to launch into the study, what you, what's on your heart to share. Okay. So how did you come across Salt Church, and uh, how did you come here? And um, it's lovely having you. And how long have you been coming to Salt Church? So I would think, I'm looking at my wife now, 15, 18 years, whatever. It was found in the Costa Blanca News in Torrevieja. We have someone making a note of that. Where's David? Costa Blanca News, Torrevieja. That's a long time ago. So you've been coming so, for a long so time. So our, our apartment was very much um, a bolt hole ministry. Oh, the other thing I haven't said is I was also running a full-time building company as well. So in all of that, it was a bolt hole. Come and crash, go home again. So it, we found... We found um, Sorry about Christian Fellowship at the time, and uh, we just love come getting refreshed and going home again. Come refresh, go home again. And that's what we've been doing for all those years. The problem is now, coming for 10 years, we've been noticed. Hence, that's why I'm standing here. <laughs> we so, can't get under the radar anymore. Paul, Paul, Paul and Dawn were able to be incognito, but not now. And so um, we're going to use uh, uh, Paul, no doubt, Dawn as well at some point, I'm sure, in lots of different ways. It's lovely to have you. Thank and you. it's lovely to get to know you. I, I've really got to know you over the last year or so since, since COVID. I think, I can't remember if we met before COVID or... Uh, Past, but, uh, we met in the toilets. We did. So do you remember that did, conversation? We, we won't talk well, about we, that. You know, as you do. So it's lovely to have you here. There is a Thank long you. association. And uh, it's great that now... You're not incognito and you're on the stage. Bring us what's on your heart. And Bless thank you so you. much. It's been lovely to interview you. And Was it a good interview? <laughs> well done. And, uh, and I pray that after this, you don't want me to go back into incognito, but we'll see how we go. One of the things I am very, very passionate about, actually, is seeing the church come to greater levels of wholeness that everybody can be the full potential of what they're created to be. That really is, in essence, my message and has been for, for, for many years. But, but I think this is like Romans 4, 18, 19. So let me just give you the title before I start. This is about being promised land thinkers. Promised land thinkers. Romans 4, 18 to 19. I think it might come up there. But it says, against all... Sorry, 18 to... 21 it is, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. 
but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Wonderful, isn't it? Now, in all of my experience, we have encouraged people to stand in faith, to take those promises and trust and believe God. But one of the things I have become very much aware of in Christian life, in the life of the church, and probably in my own life as I look back, is that Christians aren't very good at facing the facts. Silence. Facing the facts, Abraham. He faced the facts that he was as good as dead. But did not waver in unbelief, but carried on to believe that God could do what he said he would do. Facing the facts is a healthy thing to do. Yet I sit with a lot of Christians who will throw positive scriptures at things in the hope for things to change, but never in avoidance of the facts. People don't like the facts. Truth is hard to stomach sometimes, isn't it? But truth will always be our best friend. So I want to just give you facts for a moment from, so please don't kind of knee-jerk react if I use words like secular or counseling or even psychology. Because in lots of, I can get stoned for such things in some churches, you're aware of that. So here's the thing, I'm gonna get you to do an exercise because I haven't done a PowerPoint, you are now the PowerPoint. Go like that for me. That circle that you are now drawing, oh, you bring that's your exercise of the day. That circle that you are drawing, you can stop now. That is the narrative of your life. Everything that's ever been said to you, done to you, everything you've ever said to others or done to others. Every storyline in your history is in that circle. But I want to tell you what our main problem is. Go like this. Beep. It's a minute little dot in the center. And it's so minute, but if I touch it, it's going to grow as big as the moon in two seconds flat. Our emotional center. Are you aware you've got one of them? Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Because, because if I can be vulnerable with you a little bit, let me just tell you a little bit. This is how I used to be. I'm a lot better at it. Because I grew up with the conditioning that I wasn't worth much, I wasn't very good and I could have done a lot better. That was my core belief about myself. Dawn would say, have you put the bins out? And I would have a knee-jerk reaction to that because it would feel like an attack because I've not been good enough and I should have put, so I would attack back. And we get into this massive argument over bins because I couldn't control that emotional center within myself. I never faced the facts. I never dealt with that conditioning. I never dealt with my history. Whenever our brains cannot make sense or rationalize our feelings or experiences, it will always start a stress response. When it starts a stress response, it will usually go into subjective thinking. Now, did he mean this? He meant that, oh, he, he said that, but he meant that. And we're going into all kinds of narrative to try and regulate feelings that we can't control. People will, will control their environments because they can't control themselves. And I don't wanna to go too far into this because I could speak to you on this particular subject for hours. But just put that on the back burner for a moment because I do want to take you to the Bible because it's a Bible study. Numbers. So this is Numbers 13. Numbers 13. Let me get there quickly. This is the story of where the Israelites were going to go into the promised land. They send in 12 spies. You know the story, don't you? They send in 12 spies. Joshua and Caleb come back, they're ready to take it, but 10 of them are saying they can't take it. So this is the narrative. Bearing in mind what I've just told you. So verse 20, uh, 20 26, 27 will do. Um, they gave Moses this account 
We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's some of the fruit. Wow, and we see in other situations, in other parts of the Bible, where it's immense. This fruit is immense. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak, the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in their hill country. Goes on. But then Caleb, verse 30, Silence the people before Moses and says, we can go up, we can take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw were of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. How did they know they looked the same to them? Their brains had gone into a subjective narrative driven by fear that taught them out of taking the promised land. Just think about that. Driven by fear. Fear of loss, fear of death, fear of God, this amazing God. Fear that it wasn't even on their side. Subjective narrative. Their brains working from a negative bias, driven by the fear response, they talk themselves out of the possibility of entering the promised land that God had already given them. And it was going to be 40 years later before they have another chance. I have had the privilege of taking, um, taking small teams out to Uganda uh, on short-term missions, and it's quite interesting. You put you put eight people that have never been to Uganda before in a room, and they start off dead excited. And if you're not there watching them, but this is what kind of happens: Is it safe? One says. Another one goes, "Well, I think so." What happens if we get sick? What happens if we get malaria? What happens if we're not going to be used? What happens if what happens, the subjective narratives, and I walk in the room and it's almost like, should we be going on this trip? <laughs> they talk themselves out because the stress and fear response is driving them that way. That's exactly what happened here. I want to say this, and just one other illustration quickly before I do. Peter is standing, warming himself by the fire. And a girl says, surely you're one of his disciples. His dot exploded. He calls curses down on himself. I don't even know the man. Because he's driven by fear. This is what I want to say to us, and I really felt that this is what God wanted just to kind of get us to understand. The giants in the land belong to God. The giants in us belong to us. We need to trust that the giants in the land, God is going to deal with. Whatever we face, he's going to deal with. But he doesn't deal with the giants in us. That's our department. I'm sorry. Think about it this way. Think about it this way. Why does God say at least 365 times in the Bible, do not be afraid? Why don't he just take away our fear? He doesn't, does he? Because he wants us to go through the process with him of dealing with those fears. Now I want to share with you why I feel this is so, so important for the life of the church and for the future of the church and for, and for Christians. I don't know where you've seen this. I, I heard this about 20 odd years ago and it stuck with me, particularly as leading church. This is Numbers 33. Numbers 33. And I'm not going to read it all to you. This is the list of the camps in which they stayed. So they're going around the desert for 40 years, stopping. Have you ever counted them? 41 stages 
There are 41 camps, and then they are standing at the Jordan. The 42nd place is the promised land. Have you ever counted them before? It's true, count them, it's right. 41 place, Jordan. 42nd place, promised land. Have you ever been to Matthew chapter 1, genealogy of Jesus? It's interesting. I don't believe coincidences, I do believe. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I won't read them all to you for time. Verse 16 says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Verse 17, thus there are 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to, his, to the exile, to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. Dartsman among you, three 14s, quick. 42. But what's more interesting is if you count them, the first group, there is 14. The second group, there is 14. But the third group, to Jesus, is only 13. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, 13th, uh, 41st generation, 13th in that group, who is called Christ, 42nd generation. Follow me? There was 14 from the first, 14 the second, 13, but the 14th generation was the revelation of who he was. The same thing to Peter, who do you say I am? You are the Christ. He says, you did not get taught this by man, you got taught this by my Father in heaven. And on this rock, I will build my church on the revelation of who Jesus is. He is the Christ. 41st place that the, the Israelites stood at was the Jordan, 42nd promised land. 41st generation, the man born Jesus. 42nd generation, he is the Christ. It parallels the promised land, promised land thinkers. Are you following me? We need to really understand this as people because the same principles that were for the Israelites are the same for us. Because just because God has said it will be so doesn't mean it's just going to be so. Because like those Israelites, fear can stop us taking the promised land. So something that was said, um, and uh, it's been mentioned two or three times here, which is absolutely right, that, that heaven is God's throne. The earth is the footstool. We talked about Jesus, didn't we? Who was exalted to the right hand of God and sat down. And it says that he is now waiting. Waiting for what? For his enemies to be made his footstool. How? If he's sitting and waiting, how? Is the enemies being made his footstool. I want to suggest to you that it is the work and the mandate of the church to extend the kingdom of heaven or paralleled is taking the promised land and in doing so, God working through the church is bringing the enemies into subject to Jesus Christ. And one day he's going to come back. Some people say to me, promised land is heaven. There are no giants in the promised land. The kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of heaven is coming. And the kingdom of heaven will be fully established when Jesus comes back. The promised land is here. You have no doubt got many words of prophecy over the life of this church. Really encouraging words about what should be happening over the next foreseeable future. I'm sure there is. Not at me, Chris. There are prophecies over the life of this church. 
God has spoken. I want you to know that that is your portion of promised land. But whether we take it or not, depends what's going on in here. It depends whether we're driven by fear, whether we can face the facts, deal with what's going on inside, and to be able to put our trust and faith that he's got the promised land. We've just got to deal with the giants in us and go and take it. Is that? Are you following me? You've all gone dead silent on me now. <laughs> You've not gone to sleep, have you? Joshua chapter 1. So Joshua chapter 1. I find this fascinating. This is God's instruction to Joshua as he takes the promised land. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you all, uh, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give you. To the Israelites, i uh, give you to the Israelites, I will give you every place you set your foot. As I have promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Does that sound familiar? Verse 6, be strong and courageous. He's got to deal with the stuff inside of him. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Verse 7, be strong and very courageous. I mean, he's re-emphasizing, be careful to obey the law my servant Moses gave you, etc., Verse 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I've just got the idea that somehow God didn't want another 40 years in the desert. (laughs) Because that was the potential. He got everything inside them to take the promised land, but fear stopped them. I do believe that as church and, you know, we need to be people who press courage into each other. It talks about encourage one another, but press courage into each other. But often, I have found the biggest giants in the church. Sorry. (laughs) I do. You know, Chris said, will you come and share a word? A Bible study. I said, of course we'll, Chris. That's fine. Chill, in actual fact, said to me the other day, are you nervous? I said, no. So why? I said, well, I've chosen not to be. But let me tell you how I got there. I faced the facts. Chris asked me. I said to myself, subjective, what happens if the people don't like it? What happens if I don't get a good response? What happens if they never invite me again? What happens if we go to church Sunday after and we've locked the doors and won't let us in? Because that's what the brain does. Face the facts, that's what we face, we face the facts. There are fears that can come and get us, but we can own those internal feelings and emotions. There is no threat here, is there? You're not going to drag me outside and stone me. I didn't need to feel fear. Why does fear start kicking in even when there is no threat? Because that's what's happening to most of us most of the time. We need to understand what's going on in that dot 
We need to understand and face the facts of how we respond to things. Every single person in this room and everybody who would normally be here, say on a Sunday, everybody who's a part of Salt Church has a ministry and has a gift, has a part to play in serving the church to go and take the promised land. How many people say, I'm not stepping up to that? What will people think? I don't fit. In fact, I wrote down a few things I've heard in the past. No one's telling me what to do. Anybody ever said that? No one's telling me what to do. Why do they say no one's telling me what to do? It's because they're trying to protect that dog. They're trying to protect their own emotional world. Don't tell me what to do. What will people think if I do it? I need to feel in control is a big one. I need to feel in control. I can't feel out of control. All of these go up in here and are in here. And if we don't face the facts and deal with that stuff, it's potentially going to stop us being fully what God has called us to do. How many people sit in church too afraid, driven by fear when there is no threat? How can we press courage into each other to be the very best versions of ourselves that we can be for the church? The very best versions of ourselves we can be for Jesus. So that we can go and take the promised land. How much time have I had? Couple, couple more minutes. Couple more minutes. And we've got another ten minutes. Oh, wow! Let me. Well, okay. Before we look at that, end, because it's an important thing. It's an important thing. And I've got this written down. If you hold a little baby in your hands, how many of us would say that baby is precious? 100% precious. You don't put a price on it. No monetary value. The value is precious. 100%. Anybody disagree with me? Surely. <coughs> that baby has got no gold stars. It's ran no races. It's got no behaviors, good or bad. It's got no doctorate. It's got no career. It is 100% valuable before it does anything. That's how God sees us. But the world has conditioned us to believe that we get our value out of what we do. So we're striving for value rather than working from value. So years ago, part of me would be wanting to do this. So Chris or whoever might go, well, that was really good, Paul. Wouldn't that inflate my value? But if... And if any of you have preached, you've no doubt noticed this yourselves. You could have 50 people go, that was fantastic, but it's always the one. <laughs> it's always the one that says, didn't like that, that was rubbish. <sighs> Our value decreases based on what other people are thinking and saying. That lives in the church. Church should be the one place where everybody is valued for who they are, not what they do. We should all be working from value to reach our full potential for Jesus. But not in a striving sense. I'm doing this, whether you, whether you like it or not, I'm doing this purely, and I can genuinely say purely, because I'm working from value. I don't need anybody's, like, you know, say accusations, anybody's well done. Let's all work from value, not striving for it. When we work from value, I will still go to church and do all of th those things that I do because I'm valuable, not to find it. I'll serve Jesus because I'm valuable, not to find it. Does that make sense? And I think a lot of people are sit within the counting and just haven't got that. They've spent all their lives striving for value, trying to meet everybody else's expectations, getting burnt out in the process, and feeling totally devalued with depressions and all kinds of things.
because they're striving for it rather than working from it. The one thing I do think, whenever Jesus asks us to do anything, we know it's going to take faith, don't we? Because anything that's not done by faith is called what? Sin. So we know it's going to take faith. You need faith when you get to the edge of your comfort zone. You don't need faith in comfort. Let me say that again. You need faith when you step out of your comfort zone. You don't need faith when you stay in comfort. And in taking the promised land for everybody in the life of the church, you're going to have to step outside of your comfort zone if you're going to operate in faith. I want to tell you there's only one thing that's going to stop you. It's how you feel. It's how you feel. What, what, what feelings are driving it? So how can we encourage each other as church? To be all that God can be. How can we look at one another and recognize the gifts and the ministries of each other and challenge each other to step out of our comfort zones into the things that God's called us to and deal with those giants within us so that we can go and take the promised land which he has promised us through prophecy, through the word of God, through different people that have ministered in the place over many years. Stepping outside of our comfort zone. I was thinking, just finally, I was just thinking of, of how do we practically encourage one another? Because I do think there is a difference between emotional encouragement and spiritual encouragement. You see, because if somebody comes up and says, oh, Paul, that was fantastic, be encouraged. Um, you know, or emotionally making me feel better about it. That's a psychological thing that's taking place. I like the idea of, of Jonathan and David. When David was right out of sorts, Jonathan went and found him. And he didn't say, but you're a good fighter, come on. What has God said to you? God has said you will be king. God has said that you will rule over Israel. God has said that you will be king over, over Saul. You will take over. He has said these things. And he's putting courage in him through what has been said to him. What's been said to you that you need reminding of? Things that have been said maybe 10 years ago, 20 years, 30 years ago, that you need reminding of. To press in courage in the Lord to take hold of all that which is created you for. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Can I pray with you? Yes. Any questions? <laughs> I am aware I've just chucked a load of stuff out, haven't I? You need to process it. But you know, some things aren't taught, they're caught. Father, I want to thank you for this time together. Holy Spirit, we thank you. And pray, Father, that in every individual, every one of us right now, Holy Spirit, that you would have your way. Father, even in those things we'd not like to hear, help us face the facts. Help us be real. Help us to be true. Father, you know our reactions, you know our hurts, you know our pains from the past, you know our conditioning, you know the way we operate. Lord, I just want to pray that we'll just lay all that down at your feet again tonight and say, come, bring healing, help us to be open with you, help us to be open with one another. But above all, Father, I just pray you would take us all forward in that emotional growth as well as spiritual growth that we may take the promised land that you have given to us 
Help us to defeat the giants within us. And we trust you with the giants we face in the world. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Come on then, David. Come on up. There's one thing.